All right, all right. What is up, everybody? As you come in, uh, make sure you share this. Um, it's going to be good tonight. Got two brothers with me. What's up, Mr. Tyler? Richly redeemed in the house. Yeah, we're going to get into some stuff tonight. Um, tried to do something this year for Black History Month. So every week, if you notice on my channel, uh, it was a little bit different take or different aspect of of things specifically pertaining to the african-american church um we did our <laughs> candace benbo live a couple weeks ago um kind of uh, examining her work and um i released something last week if you guys didn't see it's uh africans in the old testament so that's a video you can go back and watch when you get a chance for tonight, I want to remind everybody that our goal here, my goal here with this channel is to help everybody enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. I think I got all the stuff out the way, all the uh, announcements out the way. <laughs> all right, so let's get into this. Um, let, let's go from top to bottom. Let me have my, my brothers introduce themselves. Apologists in Detroit. How you doing? What's good, fam? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, serve alongside two distinguished, you know, gentlemen such as yourselves, two people I'm privileged to call friends. Um, yeah, if you guys aren't familiar with me, I'm a, currently a missionary by vocation to the city of Detroit. Um, I'm doing a lot of justice work. I'm, I'm helping people get jobs. I'm building food pantries, make sure people are eating and things like that. All the while pointing out that this is this is a taste of the good news that Jesus brings. So that's what I do for a living. I also do a little bit of apologetics on the side. Apologies to me, Trey. So thanks for having me today. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Isaiah, yeah. Pastor Isaiah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so uh, so excited to be here with uh, with my brothers and my friends. My name is uh, Isaiah Robertson, uh, pastor of the Hope in Christ Community Church in the beautiful city of Compton, California. Uh, also the author of uh, Black Church, Empowered, a book that was published August of 2020. Uh, and yeah, I just uh, have a passion to uh, do whatever I can to see that the black church flourishes into the 21st century and beyond. So really excited to have this uh, conversation. Amen. Yes, I am as well. Um, yeah, this was kind of a, you know, a lot of times I have, there's certain things that people bring to me like, hey, that's what you think about this or should we push back on this or what's this, you know? So those are a lot of ideas come to me that way, but this is something that was kind of my own idea, not just recent, but for, for ongoing. And, and just tonight we're going to really unpack and substantiate some of the statements that I make, that you make, that some other black people make, because even in your introduction, Pastor Isaiah, you said something that a lot of people will struggle with. I'm sure, you know, the fact that there is a black church, but let's talk about why <laughs> there is a black church, because it was not just because they wanted to be different. <laughs> it was not just because they needed, you know, we want our own little club. It wasn't none of that. And so if you don't understand the reasons for things, then it can seem arrogant. It can seem a lot of things. But that's why context matters. Right. Um, so let me just say what's up to a couple more people. What up, Norman? Uh, Mr. Smith, what's up? Um, blah, blah, blah. okay, let's get into this. So, um, now I want to, I want to turn this off, preface this and say this, um, there's, there's sometimes, and if this doesn't apply to you, don't comment at me. All right. Just <laughs> if it ain't you, then move on. But there's a plenty of people out here who this does apply to that. Oh, you know, Black people, you know, you're not slaves anymore. What's the big deal? What are you complaining about? You're not, in, it's not, you know, civil rights is over. You know, what are you complaining about? You're good enough. You got, you, you know, all these types of things. So are, is it better than it was? Of course. Is that the goal? No. <laughs> is the goal better than the worst possible thing you can imagine? No. <laughs> the goal is a lot higher than that. And not, not my goal, the Bible's goal, God's goal, because of what, apologists in Detroit? Because of two words, human flourishing <laughs> human flourishing <laughs> and that's for all humans all right so look we're gonna get into this 
Um, but I just wanted to preface that because some people may not even understand why we need to do this. And we do need to do this. Um, if you're, I, I would ask everyone to say that, to ask themselves this. We need to ask ourselves, especially if you're in the church, um, anyone needs to ask themselves these questions. If, if they actually care about people and about humanity, the question they need to ask is, which is, or is why are all of, or large, large majority of these African-Americans feeling, you know, this level of angst or disgust um, as they attempt to live in America and specifically in the American church, as they attempt to reconcile the Christianity uh, presented to them and that which is set forth in the Bible. So why, like we at least should ask that question. And if, and if we're just going through history, um, just kind of glossing over some stuff, not asking that question, we're missing we're missing a lot of um, data in the process. Oh, can y'all hear me? Okay. So let's pull up this first quote. Um, uh, okay, here we go. So this is from um, W.E.B. Du Bois. And this is also going to be a little uh, little uh, book study um, for everybody who's watching because uh, these are some great books. If you haven't read them, you need to. I don't care if you're black or white. You need to read the book. <laughs> the Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, so he says this, but when to earth and brute, is added an environment of men and ideas, then the attitude of the imprisoned group may take three main forms, a feeling of revolt and revenge, an attempt to adjust all thought and action to the will of the greater group, or finally a determined effort at self-realization and self-development despite environing opinion. The influence of, of all of these at, attitudes at various times can be traced in the history of the American Negro and in the evolution of his, his successive leaders. So before 1750, while the fire of African freedom still burned in the veins of the slaves, there was in all leadership or attempted leadership, but the one motive of revolt and revenge. Typified in the terrible Maroons, the Danish Blacks, the Cato Astano, veiling of the Americans in fear and insurrection, the liberalizing tendencies of the latter half of the 18th century brought along with kindlier relations between black and white thoughts of ultimate adjustment and assimilation. But, <laughs> but when to, er oh, wait, I put that in there twice. Nope, I didn't. Okay, here we go. Such aspiration was especially voiced in the earnest songs of Phyllis and the martyrdom of addicts, the fighting of Salem and poor, the intellectual accomplishments of Banneker and Durham, and the political demands of the Cuffs. Stern financial and social stress after the war cooled much of the previous humanitarian ardor, the disappointment and impatience of the Negroes of the persistence of slavery and serfdom voiced itself in two movements. The slaves in the South, aroused undoubtedly by vague rumors of the Haitian revolt, made three fierce attempts at insurrection. So there's the 1800 Gabriel um, in Virginia, 1822 under Vesey in Carolina, and of course, 1831 in Virginia with Nat Turner. In the free states, on the other hand, a new and curious attempt at self-development was made. In Philadelphia and New York, color prescription led to a withdrawal of Negro communicants from white churches and the formation of a peculiar socio-religious institution among the Negroes known as the African Church, an organization uh, still living and controlling in its various branches over a million of men. Now, um. A lot of things stand out there. I'll just, I'll get it. I'll get the party started. So it's, it's, it's basically a situation he's describing of, you know, Africans and African-Americans. Well, first of all, let me say, I'll say this. Africans and African-Americans have never fully been included. Like, we'll just say that. So they've been looked out for and included until it's no longer convenient or until resources are low or some group. Um, has to get the, the short end of the stick. But I guess as Du Bois is describing, there was some kind of white allies or um, 
white partnership for a while and then it got a little too um a little too rich for their blood so they had to kind of to back off so what do you what do y'all what do y'all want to say there go ahead uh uh chris you want me to kick it off or 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 uh, okay 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 either way uh, yeah i mean you know thanks be to god that uh that our people didn't just say to heck with christianity altogether right um you know we you know we have these integrated churches um and you would think that in within these integrated churches um white people would love us like they love themselves. They would treat us like uh, we're, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, but even within the church, right? And this is, this is outside of the plantation, right? This is outside of the, you know, of, 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 the, of the, the, the sweltering heat and racism of the South. This is in the North, right? Where black people are, are, are still being marginalized in what are supposed to be sacred spaces. It's a marvel that they didn't just say, you know what? Forget this Christianity altogether, right? And we recognize that we're African, um, and so it's amazing that they didn't have like a rush back to you know connect to their West African religious heritages, you know. Then, um, but no, I mean they said, look, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We we believe in Christ. We're not going we're not going to let go of Christ. We just need to create our own sacred spaces. Um, and you know, I'm, I, I believe. The religion of the slave master, the religion of the, you know, the racist uh, preacher in the 18th century still exists today. It's just morphed. It's it's adapted to 21st century cultural norms. And as long as that religion exists, the black church must exist as well, um, not just as a safe space for black and brown bodies, but also as a. Um, you know, as as a as a place where we can look to the Lord uh, and not have to worry about this double consciousness that W.B. E. W. E. Du Bois talks about in his book. By the way, shout out to that book, because there's a chapter in that book called The Faith of Our Fathers. So anybody that that that, that you know, that's interested in the black church, that's a wonderful book there because of that specific chapter as well as the rest of it. It's just a masterpiece. So that's my two cents. Hey, it is a masterpiece. Yeah, um, uh, he Du Bois brought up some great points, particularly when he was talking about like the various options that you know this boy can this thing can actually play out. You know, uh, we can assimilate into their culture. Um, you know, we can establish our own thing. Um, and, and again, you know, as you brought up at the head of the show, you know, the the black church isn't something that exists because we just you know thought that we were better than we can do it better than everybody else. The black church exists because uh, we weren't allowed to coexist. So you know, to me, this is a consequence of of the the white churches. You know, at the time, descriptively speaking, the church that caused this problem would be the white church. Uh, the white church caused the problem, and now it's like the the it's difficult to have this conversation today because many people don't understand the history of it. So yeah, uh, the voice brings up some, some really great thought provoking things. Again, encourage you all to read this book. This is a great, this is a great opportunity for us to learn and grow. If there's one main thing that I think impacts those who engage in this conversation, but usually are misinformed is the fact that they're misinformed. If you're going to have a conversation about something, you should at least do, do, the justice of reading on a, on the subject so that you understand it properly so that you can adequately critique it if critique is due. So yeah, thanks. That's my two cents. Hey, no, absolutely. And, and you know, y'all know, uh, if you watch our channel, we believe in that. Matter of fact, <laughs> Chris famously was part of a live where we bought and read a book that we didn't like. Um, but we wanted to do our due diligence and we're, we wanted to be um, honest and accurate. And so I, yeah, absolutely. I encourage everybody, um, increase your library. Please, like this is, if you don't do nothing else, <laughs> increase your library. Black Church Listen, Empowered, the author's right there. Like, y'all go get the book. <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the advent of like audiobooks, like you, there's no excuse. No. It's not. You know, you can literally have a book read to you. And, and you know, most books are about, you know, six, eight hours. And if you get proficient at listening, you can speed it up and cut that time in half. So, Amen. you know, no excuse to be to be ignorant. 
Yet, if you're going to choose to be ignorant, you should choose to stay out of the conversation. Mm, I like that. (laughs) I like that. Yeah, man. I finished uh, four and a half books so far this year. So let's get it. Um, Okay. Um, So I do, since he's here, my guest of honor, I want to pull up this quote from my brother's book. And let me just pull up here. Brother Isaiah, let me just figure out where I put it. All right, everyone can see that. We good? uh, Isaiah, you can see it? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. All right, cool. Let me just read some and then I'm going to let you unpack. Um, So within organized and publicly recognized. um, Hold on. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I'll read this. Within organized and publicly recognized black churches, such as the first African Baptist church in Savannah, Georgia, worship was an all day affair. Congregants would gather for Sunday morning service, enjoy an after service meal together and reconvene for evening worship. Sunday service within the black church was literally a slice of heaven and parishioners were in no rush to return to their uh, racially restrictive and discriminatory environments. Today, though, we are centuries removed from slavery. Black people will possess what W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness, as, as Pastor Isaiah was talking about. We, are, we have a divided identity because although we're black, we have learned to look at the world through the lens of the dominant culture while simultaneously maintaining our blackness. Um, we have. Hold on. All right. So. Um, We've learned to be af- we've learned to be fluent in white and black culture to gain advantage and access. It's an exhaustingly redundant dance. At eleven o'clock on Sunday morning in the black church is one of the exceedingly rare spaces spaces where black folks can just be, can lift our hands and without and with undivided uh, minds engage in worship to the God that's brought us thus far. All right, sir, I got some bars there. <laughs> So Isaiah, can you can you help us unpack what was kind of going through your thought process when you were writing that? Yeah. So, I mean, just this reality that um, black people, in order to survive in this country, we have to understand uh, the dominant culture. We have to understand how they view things. We have to understand uh, sort of, uh, you know, how they uh, look at the world in order to navigate through this this country successfully in order to get access into um you know opportunities whether it's socially uh professionally educationally we have to you know understand that culture right it's not necessarily the case for our um you know black and white um, excuse me our white brothers and sisters um they're often ignorant of our culture and our perspectives and you know our particular uh, ways of uh, viewing the world. Um, and so it is, you know, I wrote in the book, it's an, it's an exhausting, it's an exhausting dance because, you know, we have to sort of put on, uh, you know, we have to turn on one side of our mind in order to navigate through the corporate space, in order to, you know, uh, graduate with honors from college. And then once we get home or once we get back in the neighborhood, we have to click on the other side of our mind as we're hanging out with our friends and uh, relaxing in, in, in spaces that are more comfortable to us. Uh, and the black church is really the first inst- first institution that black people built um, where like this is no longer the case. That dance ceases at the door. Right. You can come in. And now I'm not saying that the black church is perfect. Right. But but you don't have to worry about your humanity being attacked or diminished. Right. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, code switching or you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, entering into a space where you have to struggle to be accepted or struggle to be understood. Um, 
your neighbor understands you. Your neighbor understands your plight. You're able to look over and you're able to see the people that you're in community with that know uh, your uh, specific longings and, 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 and perspectives and you're worshiping together. And it is it, that, you know, I often say that worship in the black church isn't just spiritual, it's psychological as well, right? Because that ability to just breathe and be exists almost in no other place, right? In, 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 in the country, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, right? So the black church provided this, this, this unique space where black people could be fully black, right? I mean, from the, from the inception of the African-American church and the in, invisible institution, black people, you know, they went into these clandestine worship services and they said, okay, if we're gonna do this Christianity thing, we're gonna do it our way. So we're gonna bring in the ring shout, right? We're gonna bring in call and response. Right. We, it is, this is going to be uniquely, distinctly and culturally black. And it was not just the, you know, not just the space where we connected with God, but we connected with our, each other and we connected with ourselves in a very meaningful way. And that still happens today, maybe not to the same degree as it did in the 18th and 19th centuries. But that still happens today in black church spaces that are not completely assimilated. And that's a whole other story. But yeah, yeah. Set a mouthful there. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I got, I got, I got a couple comments on that. Like, cause I'm kind of the anomaly. Like, I'm the black guy that goes to the white church. Um. So in in such, like, I can wholeheartedly amen everything Isaiah just said. Like, the reality is, my first decade at this church, um, it w- it was a decade of them getting to know me in ways that you all would get to know me in 30 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Because we come from similar contexts uh, and and we understand certain things about the context that we come from. So I don't have to kind of contextualize conversations for you. We can just naturally have a conversation and and we're all fluent in in that. Um, By the grace of God, at this particular church that I'm at, though, at some point in time, we were able to start having conversations on race and culture. And uh, by the grace of God, I go to a church that's very um, progressive in the sense of their awareness of this, el- these elements and these significant aspects of, of, of uh, worship dynamics and things like that. And they're committed to growing. You know, we've uh, we've intentionally been inviting in black preachers. We've had three of them come in so far because they have an expert in black culture to, um, to help them out, you know, and bring in black preachers that are that are able to um Give them that that experience of the call and response. Give them the experience of of a, of a preacher, um, the, the the eloquence, the beauty and, and eloquence of the homiletics that that is the black preaching experience. So yeah, um, you know, first of all, I, I wanted to kind of put that out there because I, I know a lot of people, particularly if, if you're unfamiliar with any of us and you just kind of stumble into a broadcast like this, you know, <laughs> you might just think that we just bash and bash and bash, and we not. You know, it's not a it's it's not a sense of us and them other than descriptively trying to describe what we're talking about and how these things actually played out in history, as well as how they play out today and the implications of that. So, first of all, hey, so you're not getting a bunch of people who hate our white brothers and sisters. We dearly love them. And Mm -hmm. some of us even continue to do community with them. But that doesn't change the realities of this of these dynamics that we're speaking about. And I wanted to kind of paint a quick picture of how this. Thing kind of functions intellectually, right? So you have philosophically these the, these notions or these ideas of the distinctions between black and white churches, black and white culture, and things. And we can argue about the um, we can argue which is you know closer to biblical, right? We can argue something like that if if we wanted to. And often that's what we do. We have these discussions on a very philosophical level, and what we're ignoring is the sociological level. The reality is. When you put these, when these environments exist in in three D in real life, when these environments and are impacting all of our human senses, how we smell, what we taste, what you know, what we see and hear on a, on a weekly basis as we live our lives out in the, in these various contexts or these different contexts, or um, on Sunday mornings as as we're kind of living it out in in practice. This is where the rubber hits the road. And this is where a lot of these problems become, we become more keenly aware of these problems and how problematic they truly are. Because the the sociology of it is really where we need to 
begin to engage a little bit more and, and be, be, be able to wrap our minds around so we can understand why these things are relevant. We can wax philosophical for ages. And guess what? We Americans, we modern Americans, we're really good at doing that. We're really good at ignoring the social implications of these things in lieu of believing that we philosophically or logically are thinking about these things adequately or properly. What, what, what it takes, what's really hard to do is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Is to go put yourself in an environment. I tell people all the time. I, I you know, I, I talk to my my fellow uh, church members, and I tell them like, "Hey, you know how you guys felt this morning? How that that awkward feeling when when my my buddy Colin was preaching or my buddy Mike Holloway was preaching this morning? That's how I felt for ten years. <laughs> That's how I felt for ten years. Imagine having that feeling every single Sunday <laughs> until you get acclimated. You know what I'm saying?" So yeah, that's you know I just, I just wanted to kind of particularly share that those two points. One is like, hey, we got we got skin in the game in the sense that like there's not a complete divorce. You know, there's a there's a sincere and genuine desire for God's church to flourish as a whole. We just recognize that it's difficult to do, and and I would argue that it's more difficult to do for sociological reasons than philosophical reasons. Philosophical reasons, you know, we we'll disagree and we'll cut you off and we'll never gain the opportunity to truly understand. The way you understand things like this is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, loving them enough, your neighbor enough to put yourself in your shoes, understand how this thing is, is really happening, and then begin to assess and, and, and engage. So, yeah, that's my two cents. Hey, good stuff, man. It's actually a good segue into this next quote. And I want to preface this for those listening. We always got to do this. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez uh, wrote this book, Theology of Liberation. Now, I know a lot of people already struggle with liberation theology. I'm not here to, I'm not here capping for liberation. Like, just if you're the type of person <laughs> that cannot listen to a, a quote or a statement from a person that you already know you disagree with and get the truth value from that statement, then you might need to log off. So <laughs> I'm just going to say that now. Like, I can listen to somebody that I totally disagree with, but they might say one right thing. Now, I personally believe Gustavo said a lot of right things, but his leanings into socialism, I'm not, I don't co-sign. Y'all, I've said that numerous times. This is well, he's writing well before CRT, but y'all probably throw him in that camp too. So let me just cover all my bases right now. I'm not here for CRT. Neither was Gustavo. I'm not a socialist or a Marxist, not trying to be. We're talking about dynamic sociological. That's the perfect way to say it, Chris. Because that's really what he's dealing with is the sociology of, of the situation. All right. Hey, man. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and even though Alex is not in the liberation, if you read Luke, Luke 4, Jesus certainly is. But don't get me started. Now. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to get you started. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the true sense, in the ultimate sense, we all should embrace liberation theology. To, to kind of to your point, Chris. Where where some people have an issue is with the cones and the Gutierrez's and the, you know, and I get it, but like, look, we got to be mature. Y'all, we got to be able to read. And and you think I agree with all these people up here? <laughs> like, like, come on, man. <laughs> I wonder if they have the same problem with Edwards and Whitfield. And we're going to get there in one second. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, you, 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 you know, I love trouble. Don't you? <laughs> don't get me. Don't get me kicked off. Um, okay. So, Let's talk about it. He says this, writes this rather, but in order for this liberation to be authentic and complete, it has to be undertaken by oppressed, I'm sorry, by the oppressed themselves and so must stem from the values proper to them. Only in this context can a true cultural revolution come about. From this point of view, one of the most creative and fruitful efforts implemented in Latin America is the experimental work of Paulo Freire, who has sought to establish a pedagogy of the oppressed. By means of an unalienating and liberating cultural action, which links theory with praxis, we talk about that, the oppressed receive and, and modify their relationship with the world and with other persons. They must make the transfer from a naive awareness, which does not deal with problems, gives too much value to the past, tends to accept mythical explanations, and tends toward debate to a critical awareness, which delves into problems, is open to new ideas, replaces magical explanations with real causes, and tends to dialogue in this process, which Freire calls conscien conscien 
conscientization. <laughs> Can't talk tonight. The oppressed reject the oppressive consciousness. Um, sorry, this is not sharing. I just realized that y'all didn't say nothing. <laughs> All right, let me share. I was going to tell you once you finished that. You didn't share. <laughs> I wasn't. I thought he just decided not to share it. I was just like, hey, we rolling. <laughs> hey, it's all good. It's all good. Um, all right. Um, okay, so here we go. They become by themselves less dependent and freer as they um, commit themselves to the transformation and building above society. Let us specify also that this critical awareness is not a state reached once and for all, but rather a permanent effort of those who seek to situate themselves in time and space to exercise their creative potential and to assume their responsibilities. Awareness is therefore relative to each historical age, stage of a people and of a humankind of humankind in, gener in general. Okay. So he's saying, you know, I'm trying to summarize if I can, because it's hard to, to encapsulate it all, but basically that, this this awareness of people who at least started off being oppressed has to be internal, and um, once that happens, they they can begin to maneuver about and and make the appropriate adjustments to get a truer sense of freedom freedom at least in their mind, uh, kind of that that Isaiah Pastor Isaiah was talking about before that to to kind of get out of this double consciousness and and, and but the, another thing I want to point out here. So we have a Hispanic uh, theologian. This is in the 60s, I believe he's writing. We've got we got Du Bois. We got uh, we're going to look at Frederick Douglass. We're going to look at MLK. Like there, the, it does. If we're if, if anybody's watching this, uh, particularly in a dominant culture, let me just say that. And you're not asking yourself, man, why are these people who seem to look uh, alike all seeming to feel the same way and seeming to search for a way out of this double consciousness and seeming to search for this this true and complete and full and freeing awareness why is that seem to be ubiquitous across black and brown peoples who uh, um have this history at least of oppression in um in the western hemisphere and so gustavo for whatever people want to say about him He's trying to work through that as well and trying to find solutions because he's looking at real human beings who are experiencing real human suffering and not real human flourishing. So so that is a problem that was a problem for him. If if we if, if somebody disagrees with his his tactics or his solutions, cool, propose something better, but don't sweep the problem under the rug. And that's kind of where I think the, the issue is where we are today is that. Some want to sweep the problem under the rug because they didn't like the solutions of the past or even of the present. But if we're if we're really about human flourishing, we have to ask and answer these questions. All right. What y'all got? Well, first of all, let me say shout out to uh, Zion McGregor, who's watching MJ Jackson, uh, who's watching Brittany Brown, who's watching. Uh, Michelle Turner, man, I, I love all of you guys. So, so, so glad to uh, to be uh, to be chilling and chatting with all of you. Zion, I, look, I, I'm still trying to figure out when when, when I'm going to be able to get more than six hours of sleep. Doc, uh, uh, pursuing a PhD is the furthest thing from from my mind right now. But no, no, um, you know, Alex, I, you know what I, what I think is is, is that like. Gutierrez and 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 later on Cone, you know, they they, they recognize something. You know, they Cone particularly helps white, um, you know, primarily theologically liberal uh, intellectuals and scholars realize that all theology is culture bound, and there is there is no way. I don't care, you know who you are, where you're from, what your background is, there is no way to approach theology, to approach the scriptures uh, without your, you know, without a, a cultural lens over your eyes through which you're viewing these things, right? Um, the problem has been, though, that our brothers and sisters within the dominant culture do not recognize, right, that their theology and a lot of their conclusions are culturally shaped. Um 
However, those that are historically marginalized and oppressed, we recognize it right offhand, right? Enslaved people recognize, wait a minute, that 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 doesn't it, it that, that doesn't sound like a God who's good and who's liberative, right? The, whatever this 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 person is preaching doesn't seem to line up with this God of the Exodus. There's there there must be some type of filter through which their theology is flowing, right? And so thankfully we have Gutierrez, we have Cone that comes along later, and they and they and they help our our brothers and sisters within the dominant culture come to terms with the reality that much of the conclusions that they've reached theologically are culturally shaped and culturally informed and not necessarily biblically shaped and biblically informed, which is why human flourishing hasn't been um, a, a a primary motif in 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 their you know in their religious practices mm-hmm. and so uh, yeah 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 and, and and just to reiterate the last point that I made this goes right back to this philosophical versus sociological um, and 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 to kind of to, to to add to that like in that quote uh, Gutierrez talked about oppress like today if you use the word oppression. They start yelling CRT. <laughs> they start. They start. They start labeling you, and they never get around. To, they they want to argue about the lexicon of the discussion, and they want to prevent you from using certain words because, in their minds, those words are the equivalent to some secular concept that they think is unbiblical. People, go read your Bibles. The word oppression appears over a hundred times in both the Old Testament. And the New Testament, where Jesus said, I come to set the oppressed free, Luke chapter four, there's that liberation I was talking about right there. Um, Or Acts chapter seven, when Stephen is telling the story of Israel and talks about how they were captured and oppressed in Egypt. Oppression is something that God cares deeply about. God cares about these real bodies. He's not just in love with our souls. He actually cares about our bodies. And the story of scripture is addressing both the body and the soul. Go read Mark chapter 10. What is it, like 29 to 30? He said, no man who's left mother, father, sister, brother, house, and home for the sake of the kingdom will not likewise receive a hundred times that in this age, mothers, fathers, sister, brothers, houses, and in uh, in addition to that um, persecution and in the kingdom to come eternal life, you'll re- you receive it in its fullest fruition. You know, a part of this discussion has to do with, or part of the reason that um, the theology that we're talking about is genuinely theology is because it's the theology of the scriptures. Go read your Bibles. Oppression is is not intersectionality. It's not simply CRT. Those might be distortions of it. I don't know, because I'm not an expert on CRT. I'm at least honest enough to say I'm not an expert on CRT or intersectionality. Neither are it they. may not be that. Neither <laughs> right, neither are they. But even if, it, even if those are distortions of it, that doesn't change the reality that the Bible is replete with this as a theme. And we Christians today, if our theology is not replete with these themes as the Bible is, then maybe our theology isn't theology. And I think I also think there's a level of like embarrassment, right? Because you would honestly have to admit that the intuitive uh, theological prowess of the enslaved person was far more superior than the 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 theology of a Whitfield or a Edwards or you know insert name here, and that's embarrassing, right? Here are people that are. Um, illiterate as far as the English language is concerned, and their theological construct, their theology proper, right, is more accurate and closer to the scriptures than, you know, the 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 the, the most well-known congregationalist ministers of that age and of that time. Right. That is embarrassing, right? right? Because, you know, they want to tout all of their, you know, Puritans and all of their, you know, the books by all these guys when enslaved people say, hold up, I'm not necessarily sure that your soteriology is right and accurate. And I'm not necessarily sure that you have a proper understanding of biblical theology if 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 the God that you're proclaiming doesn't look like the God of Exodus. And, and these are enslaved people. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and they don't have, you know, um, um, you know, educations at, 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 at Princeton and all of these all of these wonderful institutions. It's embarrassing. Yeah. And I think that, that they'd rather uh, in, uh, avoid that altogether and create these straw man arguments to deny what is abundantly true. Enslaved people had a better understanding of the God of the scriptures than a lot of these astute theologians that they revere and lionize. Mm. Amen. Um, no, that's really good. I, I hadn't thought about that, that, that component. And, and, you know, I was reading this book by John Thompson. I came as a shadow. It's a great book. Uh, it's not a theology book just so y'all, you know, don't get mad at me y'all, but it's a great book to explain the sociological implications of being black in America, at least. Um, but the, the title of the book says it all. And, 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 and I think in the introduction or first chapter, he explains it basically is that he said it, trying to address or capture racism now today is like trying to catch a ghost because the times we're talking about it was overt it was out there it was legal it was it was like this person this group like it's very easy to point the you know but now i i can't see what's in this guy's head just walking down the street next to me like i can't see what's in this person's head that just interviewed me i like so it's all co covert and and because there's legal ramifications on the other side for being racist now which is good but it doesn't change a heart and those people who had the same heart from the 60s 70s and prior unless god changed it they still got the same heart so they're around and we just we don't always know who because because it's not uh acceptable to be overt and so therefore we you talk about the double consciousness we also got to play this is this ally are they good are we like we got to play this game of like whose side you are <laughs> you know a lot of times as we um as we go through the day um Brittany, i'm not sure which which book are you talking about the one you just the, the one you referred to oh what did i say just just, um, just a second ago dang, I, I just lost track that quick <laughs> What book was I talking about? I don't know. I'll think of it. Okay, let's move to the next one. So Frederick Douglass. Uh, This is actually from a biography of Frederick Douglass by William McFeely. It says this, my association with the excellent men who preached at the New Bedford Zion Chapel helped to prepare me um yeah helped to prepare me for the wider sphere of usefulness which i have since occupied it was from this zion church that i went forth to the work of delivering my brethren from bondage and this new vocation which separated me from new bedford separated me from separated me also from the calling of a local preacher soon after he took to the field of for anti slavery he wrote a candid letter to his fellow communicants of the Zion Chapel saying, as James reported, that he had to cut loose from the church because he had found the American church writ large to be a bulwark or a, a proponent or supporter of American slavery. His affection for the chapel that had been his and Anna's never faltered. But Frederick Douglass was now committed to a new faith, one for which he would speak to the word. Um. Let's see here. So what I want to say, well, let me just give a a very brief background. So for people who need to know this, um, Douglas believed he believed in dialogue. So so we know that he was abolitionist. We know. And and I think this is something that everyone needs to know. And we did a live at the beginning of this month. I did it with MJ speaking to MJ. Uh, examining MLK and CRT and all these different things. But part of that was so cool and part of it was so necessary because a lot of people don't know anything about MLK. They they know he gave a, I have a dream speech and they know he wrote a letter when he was in jail one time. That's it. <laughs> right, as it. So it was part of it. It was just like, okay, you don't even know what you don't know. So let's let's catch up because you don't, you, you're not even equipped enough to have a position yet because you don't even know that you don't understand the foundations here. So <clears throat> Frederick Douglass was interested in dialogue. He wasn't against talking to, to white people, uh, nor am I, nor are we. 
and he wanted to make alliances. He wanted to bring racial harmony, as obviously did MLK. But when there was radical abolitionists and they had this model, no union um, with slaveholders that criticized Douglas's willingness to engage in dialogue with slave owners, he replied, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. And I think that's that should be our position. If you're doing right, let's let's tag team. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Apologies in Detroit. That was the book. Yep. Good book. Uh, come on back in, though. <laughs> so, so Pastor Isaiah, what do you, when you see this quote by Freddie Douglas, and even if it's not this quote, just when you think about him, um, the most famous quote that I think most people are aware of is, what does he say? I can see nothing but the widest possible difference between the Christianity of the Bible and the Christianity of this nation. This is a former slave, runaway slave, who, as Pastor Isaiah said, he, he's like, I don't have an issue with Jesus. <laughs> I got an issue with the people claiming him. And and that's the issue. But I think there's something so brilliant. Now, Frederick Douglass was brilliant. But there's something so brilliant in even the less brilliant African slaves that did also come to that realization, which is that the Holy Spirit was 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 doing an amazing work to get them to look past. When we say oppression, we don't have a really an understanding of that today. If I could, if we went through and talked about some of the practices that were, people know hanging. I'm not, if I said breaking the bull, some of y'all don't know what that is. Look it up later. I'm not going to say what it is. This is a common practice that they would, slaves, slave masters would do to slaves, to humans. And when you read up what that is, that practice, it's, it's sick. And so then to do that and you're in church on Sunday. And so for, for anybody, black, white, or indifferent, to look at this situation and say, you know what, I, even though they're talking about this Jesus guy, I, I definitely know I can't be like that, but there's something about this Jesus guy. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, like you said it so well, Isaiah, it is remarkable. Um, it is remarkable. That, it's remarkable that there's any black African-Americans left <laughs> like at all, especially Christians. Um, what, do you, what do you want to say there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's a shame that our uh, black historical figures are often detached from their faith as if their faith is sort of an inconsequential aspect or element of their lives. Yes. When they, Frederick Douglass was who he was, you know, Sojourner Truth, she was who she was. Harriet Tubman was who she was. Henry Highland Garnett was who he was. Like these people, they, 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 they you can't divorce them from their faith because their deep and rich Christian faith informed their activism. And it's a shame that in a lot of uh, documentaries, I, I was watching just last night, the, the new Lincoln documentary on the History Channel. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass played a prominent role in, in that documentary as he should have, but they said nothing about his faith. I mean, he was an African Methodist Episcopal Zion member, supporter, same as Harriet Tubman. I mean, these were deeply devout believers in Jesus Christ. Um, and so, you know, you know, yeah, you know, to your point, it, it, it is it is miraculous, right, that uh, African-Americans in the face of the worst discrimination, worst mistreatment, often in the name of Jesus, right, um, still said, uh, we want Jesus, we just want the real Jesus. Right. Uh, and Frederick and Frederick Douglass was one of those guys. Uh, not just that, but that's that's sort of that's the foundation of the entire African American church. Now, you know, you 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 still have this desire though um, to assimilate and and even to get gain the approval of the dominant culture, which is why sort of the black church kind of drifts into. Um, you know, a, a sort of more of a relaxed state uh, as Booker T. Washington was, you know, the prominent black, you know, sort of figure in America. Booker T. Washington's program was about accommodationism, right? Booker T. Washington's program was primarily about, look, let's not really worry about, you know, uh, trying to, you know, gain our rights through the political process. Let's Let's let's, you know, learn to work with our hands. Let's get, you know, gain traits and maybe through social, you know, through uplift and through moral suasion, we can uh, convince the dominant culture that we're 
just like them and that, you know, but and so and so the African-American church sort of went with that program and in walking away from this, you know, activist, uh, you know, politically and civically engaged institution that it had been prior, um, you know, it it, 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 it it forgot about this push towards human flourishing. Right. It just said, look, just worry about, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and don't don't sin, you know, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang with those that do find a trait and then we'll be accepted versus let's put our boots on the ground and let's, you know, let's, let's, let's be a subversive witness in this country. Right. Yeah. And so even though, right, the history and the legacy of the black church is one of rejecting the slave masters religion for true Christianity, even within, you know, the, 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 the minds and the hearts of, uh, you know, formerly enslaved and oppressed people, there, there, there's still uh, even a tendency to sometimes drift away from that, that mooring, drift away from that witness back to something that's less radical, more subdued, uh, and even, you know, similar to, to the expression of our, of our of white brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we always have to be on guard for, you know, and, and watchful for. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, let me stop right there. Yeah. Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. I, Isaiah just said something that was so profound, guys. And, 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 and y'all forgive me for being redundant because I'm, it, I'm convinced that it escaped y'all. <laughs> he ran down a list of iconic African Americans and he noted, we think of them for anything other than their theology. We think of them for anything other, even the most notable of them, Dr. Martin Luther King. We think of him more of a civil rights leader. Reverend Dr. Martin. Reverend than a pastor and a theologian. He thought of himself as a theologian. I was on the this this Zoom early with uh, with Dr. Um, Micah Edmonds, you know, who's kind of his PhD is is on Martin Luther King, and and he's kind of talking about you know how Martin Luther King viewed himself, and it's like it's amazing. That's a profound thing. And if that doesn't if, if that doesn't make make you pause and reflect on the fact that why why is it that I think of white people as theologians, but I think of black people as anything but theologians, anything but, you know, contributors to good exegetical truths from the Bible. That's one. I'm going to tell you why. Why I think that is it, why that is the case. I think that's the case because I think that we've made a false dichotomy between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. I think orthodoxy and orthopraxy is like a coin. You flip it and you get heads and it's orthodoxy. You flip it again, you get tails, it's orthopraxy. If you cut this coin in half, it loses its value. It's no longer a coin. You, you can't use it for its proper function. So philosophically, historically, because of the fact that they were free, and Africans were slaves or Africans were secondary citizens and looked down upon and, and not permitted to go to the, to, to, to the best and most notable and prestigious um, places of education where we can prove our merits. Because of that, white people are notably thought of as the people of orthodoxy. And they seemingly have made orthopraxy subsidiary, something less. And that's why when we when we note all of these actions, all of these ways that African Americans contributed to the, our understanding of the Bible through orthopraxy, they did orthodoxy as well. And just I'm pretty sure there's white people who've done orthopraxy as well. But predominantly speaking, African Americans' con contribution has largely been um, truth of Scripture as expressed in in the way that people live in orthopraxy. And, and, and that's that's really one of the biggest problems. Making a distinction between uh, in a place where there should not be one, because just as scripture says, there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Acts 4, was it 4 and 12? Um, Jesus himself says, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was in prison, did you come and visit me? Do the least of these that you did, these two, you did this for me. Depart from me out into utter darkness. Orthopraxy is every bit as much the standard of what Christianity truly is as orthodoxy. And the sooner that we come to this understanding and the sooner we begin to, we begin to recognize those throughout history who have brought us the truth of God 
through identifying proper orthopraxy, the better off the church will be. And until then, we're, we're going to continue to have these types of problems. And, and, and I, you know, y'all know me, I'm the social justice guy. I'm the guy that's saying like, hey, I, my contention is that mo most Christians are more American than Christian. You know, you know, uh, Biden is their Lord. Trump is their Lord. Jesus is not their Lord because they live the, they live by the ways of these politicians instead of our politician. Our politician is Jesus. He is our king. He set right. the standard. So again, orthopraxy, orthodoxy, one coin. You cannot separate them. And those black people, we need to begin to start to recognize them for the great contributions that they have made to this wonderful church that God has established here in America. Amen, man. Y'all got some bars tonight. Like, this is good. So, man, you know, I've been talking about orthodoxy, orthopraxy for the last, pretty much since the pandemic started. I don't know why that went hand in hand, but um, trying to explain this, some to lay people and some to um, people who I would consider very theologically sound mature, but they just don't understand the cultural connection of where they're dropping the ball, po possibly on the orthopraxy set. So we, we have conversations on that. So, um, yeah, you, if you're, if you're, if you're engaging full fledged in orthopraxy without the, um, the orthodox underpinnings, then it's just kind of behavior modification. And that's not what God's interested in. And so orthopraxy, orthopraxy should be a natural, natural outgrowth from a proper, uh, biblically sound orthodox position. Um, let, let, let me put, let me put it another way. There's more than one way to be a heretic. Ooh. <laughs> um, I got to speak in tongues on that one. Chateau <laughs> Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man, let's get to this last section. Um, um, bless you. And so, we talked about Whitfield and Edwards and, you know, some people may not know who these people are. So let me just tell the brief synopsis. These are considered two of the, if at the, at their times, they were considered at their times, the greatest preachers in this country at, at their respective times, you know, by the majority of people, I, I would say. So, uh, both 18th century, um, 17th, 18th century Whitfield is in, Georgia, Edwards is in New England. Now, <laughs> this may come as news to some people. Slavery existed in the North, too. Oh, oh, I got news. <laughs> New England was the first state to legalize slavery. Yes. 1631. Yes. Oh, advocated for by a by a method, not was it a Methodist pastor? Yes. It was one of those, it was one of those um. One of those famous preachers, uh, Mathers, one of those Mathers guys, pastors, God, is the God guy Mathers. that that, that, yeah, that advocated for the legalization. I learned that in Stamp from the beginning when I read that. Apparently someone had, had gifted him a slave and he started growing tobacco in his backyard and he wanted to kind of corner the market on, on growing tobacco. So he lobbied for them to legalize slavery in the state. So the, the first state that slavery was legal in the United States was Massachusetts. The north. Hell y'all gotta do this history lesson. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and and also you know, piggyback over that, you know, the, the 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 last enslaved person that was actually freed wasn't in Galveston, Texas. It was actually in Delaware. So <laughs> Galveston, Texas is is you know that's where we get Juneteenth from. Right. But it was in Delaware where actually the last uh, enslaved person was freed. And I got an analogy. So like if the G Gutenberg printing press uh, is Facebook, then then uh, Whitfield and Edwards are like TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, so look, let's um, go to this next part. And actually, let's let's unpack. So this is a little bit of a snippet that kind of will help us to. Um, where is it? Here we go. So we know exactly what we're who we're talking about. So with Jonathan Edwards, I hope everybody can see this. Um, he was um, known as a great preacher, but he was also a slave owner. Lived seventeen oh three to seventeen fifty eight. 
Um, I know, are y'all able to see this right now? It's not showing up. Can you see it? I can see it. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me scroll down here. So this says, Jonathan Edwards never repented of his racism and his zeal for godliness, theology, and the church entrenched him further into his racism. In this article, uh, they, they discuss further those things. And obviously, we're not going to read the whole article. Um, I'll try to include a link later when I get done with when we get done with this live. But uh, this part here, it says on June 7th, 1731, Jonathan Edwards purchased an African girl named Venus, who was 14 years old in Newport, Rhode Island. So, look, I just wanted to share that so that everybody's aware of who we're talking about and um, that we're not making it up. <laughs> no, 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 no. Speaking of making it up, like if you would have scrolled a little bit further down in the article, they actually have some some uh, copies of the actual letters because later on he wrote a defense of slavery of pastors owning slaves, and he 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 wrote it as though he was writing it for a pastoral to defend a pastoral friend of him, but they speculate that he was actually writing it about himself. He was, he was the pastoral friend himself that he was trying to defend because he was being criticized for purchasing slave. So he was he was writing for a friend. He was, he was yeah, <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> let me uh, let me read this. Um, this this part here from the book, The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. Another great book. Y'all should go get it. Um, and then we'll then we'll open up. So as enslaved people struggle to obtain liberty for their bodies because god cares about the whole person body mind and soul so they were in pursuit of spiritual freedom as well despite the liberating promise of the gospel the american church remained a place of bondage for enslaved people who became christians when they converted and embraced the gospel enslaved africans made their professions of faith and segregated services which were designed to convert their souls but not their bodies the revivals of the 1700s spread throughout the american colonies and were filled with promise and contrast and contradiction. So George Whitefield is the other guy we got to talk about. In Georgia, the most famous preacher of the time held massive rallies and preached the gospel to everyone in attendance, whether they were white or black. Yet he comprised, compromised rather on his biblical convictions when he purchased enslaved human beings to build an orphanage. There's a whole lot of irony in that. <laughs> but anyway, um, he compounded his sin, taking it a step further by convincing the Georgia colony to overturn his prohibition on slavery Whitefield proclaimed the gospel, yet he still violated its core tenet of love for our neighbors. Jonathan Edwards, Jr., preached against the evils of slavery, even as his father, the acclaimed preacher Jonathan Edwards, who we've been talking about, had enslaved people of his own. Many church historians fail to mention these evils when they teach about these men and unpack the context of their lives. Christians today frequently choose to focus on the intellectual contributions these men made to the gospel and the church, not their ethical failures, which is like a case in point of what apologists in Detroit was just saying about the uh, tendency to divorce orthodoxy from orthopraxy. Um, so these men, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and, and I don't, I hope everybody, like I'm going to pull a, I'm going to pull a Chris right here. I hope y'all didn't miss this. <laughs> this is not just being complicit. At least when we talk about Whitfield, I want, I want you to very, very clearly understand all y'all who've gone through seminary, you, you were taught to read Whitfield. You had to write paper. I get it. I had to write papers, too. You do what you got to do. Like Pastor Isaiah said, in order to make it through these institutions, we got to play the game. That's that double. That's the double consciousness we got to deal with. So um, it doesn't say, and, and not just doesn't say, George Whitfield did not just engage in owning slaves. He spearheaded the effort for Georgia to become a chief slaveholding territory. That's a difference. All right. I don't want to be clear. And if you like, check the historical record, I'm not going to spend time trying to prove that case because it's been proven numerous times. It's not, it's not even up for debate, but it may be news to some people listening today. And that's the part of the reason we're doing this live, because I think the more, you know, the better you, the better you do. Like, hopefully that's how it goes. <laughs> but, um, Look, we all make mistakes. That's the, the typical clapback. We all we're nobody's perfect. We're not talking about making mistakes. We're not talking about being imperfect. We're talking about continuing to laud or exalt people who we know we now know 
were deeply flawed if you believe the Bible. And so for that reason, it's not like we burn all the books. I'm just saying, hey, we need to understand them in the proper context and put them and their statements in their proper framework to not give um, too much credence or over overdo the credence we give to the statements just because they're famous. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So I'm not saying that they never said anything theologically sound or never said anything helpful. They did. But that doesn't excuse engaging in one of the greatest sins in the history of the world while pastoring. It's a problem. And so to this day, like except for this live, maybe <laughs> people still put Edwards and Whitfield, like you every seminary you go to, they're you're gonna talk about them to this day. To this day. And so I'm not saying I know seminaries ain't gonna you know change their change their syllabus for me. I'm just telling you as you go there, go with your 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 eyes wide open, your ears wide open, and go with an understanding of the full breadth of the historical context of this country. All right. Yeah, just to modernize it a little bit, you know, there's a difference between the guy that, you know, discreetly watches porn at home, right? That's sinful, right? There's a difference between that guy and Hugh Hefner. <laughs> so let's see if let's see if somebody will create a T-shirt that says uh, George Whitfield uh, was the Hugh Hefner of slavery. <laughs> <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> when we think about it in those terms, though, now just imagine somebody come along and saying, you know, well, well, Hugh Hefner was just a man of his time. Look at the look at the books that he wrote. Look at the theological contributions he made. Now, of course, we know that Hugh Hefner wasn't a theologian. But just imagine somebody 100 years from now, you know, coming along and trying to, you know, justify Hugh Hefner's pornographic empire by dismissing him as just a man of his times. Right. And, and, but, and also what we have to understand is there were also other men of those times that were against the institution of slavery. Right? You have Daniel Marshall, right? Daniel Marshall, white guy, Daniel Marshall, established the Baptist church in the state of Georgia, contemporary of Jonathan Edwards, right, was opposed to the institution of slavery. Um, you have... Um, uh, the guy that started Methodism. Um, uh, come on now. Wesley, John Wesley, mm. right? John Wesley uh, and Charles Wesley, right? Both opposed to the institution of slavery. So we can't just dismiss them as men of their time. As a matter of fact, if, if, if they lived during the time of, you know, C.H. Spurgeon, they would have labeled Spurgeon as a social justice heretic. Because as a liberal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a liberal, right. They would have said Spurgeon was, was trying to be woke, right? Because <laughs> Spurgeon refused to, 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 to be in communion with slaveholders and, 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 and people that, that justify the institution of slavery. So it's, it's hypocrisy, right? It's blindness, uh, and unfortunately, it's 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 a part of the the the, the evangelical machine and the culture. It, like mm -hmm. slavery was slavery was abolished in Great Britain in 1833. It took another. It was 1862 here in the U.S. So it took another 30 years. Anybody in that era of time that was affluent would be well read. They would be well aware of the political issues of their days because there was a very close relationship between the church and the state in spite of the fact that they wanted separation from him. Like who, who was publishing George Whitfield's letters? None other than Tommy Jefferson himself was mm. publishing George Whitfield's letters here in the US. And all you have to do is read some American history and what you'll find out is these people weren't blind and ignorant. These people were much like the, uh, the people that we see and face today. They are so arrogant. They're so blinded by what they believe in spite of the fact that they, they don't read their Bibles because the Bible talks a lot about oppression and liberation. Mm -hmm. But in spite of the fact that they, they don't understand the problems, they're just arrogant and, and they're not willing to listen. They have calcified hard hearts. And so the real problem is not the fact that there wasn't light for people to know, know to do better than what they're doing. 
the, the real issue is that these people were able to get away with it because the majority of people during these times were okay with it, you know, and that's not just the Christians, it's the secular people. And this goes back to, you know, my comment earlier about American Christians being more American than Christian. Like we really have to, and it also goes back to the comment about sociology versus philosophy. We have to recognize that we live in a very, like culture throughout the history of humanity has been pervasive. Read the story of Israel. The story of Israel was God gave them the most righteous of laws that will give them wisdom. Go read Deuteronomy chapter four, right? That's what it says. All the nations were gonna see that the, the, the Yahweh, their God was with them with they pray. That's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter four. But what did Israel do? She prostituted herself. She wanted to be like the Canaanites. She wanted to be like Babylonians. She wanted to be like anybody other than the people of God who she was called to be. And God would not tolerate, uh, uh, God would not tolerate that. Yeah. And so God called her to repentance and punished her for her sins. So what we have to recognize is like, hey, all human beings have a propensity, a, a, an innate leaning towards being shaped by the cultures of our day that we live in. And if anything stands out from this discussion today is that way too often the people of God find themselves standing on the wrong side of, of orthopraxy, the wrong side of issues that God cares deeply about, speaks often about, and, and um, somehow we Christians seem to miss that. And I don't want to be one of those Christians. I don't want to be, I don't want, I don't want my grandchildren to look back to, you know, 60, 80 years ago, great grandchildren look back 60, 80 years ago and can rightly see that Martin Luther King was right. Martin Luther King was killed after the civil rights laws passed. He was still marching after the law passed. He's still marching and, and he gets assassinated while he's still marching, while he's got like a 75% disapproval rating. Everybody in their mama that I know today, even people who disagree with social justice, always got Martin Luther King name in their mouth. They always bringing him up like everybody knows he got it right. We, they didn't believe he got it right in his time. And guess no. what? It's not likely that many of us get it, get it right today. It's more likely that we are more shaped by our cultures and society's values than the biblical. And the only way we it will ever be otherwise is for us to be deeply committed into <coughs> Bible communities and for us to actually read our Bibles. That's it. Other than that, we're just going to continue the cycle of the people of God being wayward and sinful. Yeah, sorry. I'm listening, man. I'm just reading through. Um, Are you tripping out over uh, Daniel Maxwell? Yeah, I like this. Is the flex. <laughs> anyway, let me just say this real quick because I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm going to read all yeah. that. But yeah. we're not talking about abortion. I'm against abortion. That has nothing to do with tonight. So Hold on. I'm against abortion. Uh, are you against abortion, Isaiah? Absolutely. You're anti-abortion, right, Isaiah? Absolutely. I'm anti-abortion too. Are you anti-abortion, Alex? I am too. So all right. So <laughs> yeah, it has nothing. Don't, to do with right. That. So like, all right. I don't get last it. Last one. Uh, no, actually, actually, uh, Chris, did you want to talk about this letter from the Gazette? So this is the actual letter from from uh, Reverend George Whitfield at that time. Yeah, that's the one that that, that uh, this is the one that later on that uh, that that uh, that uh, President Jefferson later later on President Jefferson posted. It's on the right. You can't really see it from from this the font on it, uh, but maybe we'll we'll put a link out where people can have access to it and read it for themselves. Okay. Um... Yeah, Mr. Maxwell. No, it doesn't. If you if you came late, that's probably why you think it has something to do with it, but it doesn't. Um, we're talking about see, historical. See, see, we're talking see, about the see, black church historically. Let me just say this real quick. This is what happens when we go after evangelical idols, right? There's a rush to deflect and say, but 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 what about abortion? No, let let's 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 focus on the issue at hand, okay? Uh, and let's not try to deflect away from the topic that we're discussing, but that's what happens oftentimes, right? There's not a there, there there's not a rush to embrace this reality and 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 sit with it and and you know it, it's let's just deflect and let's make it about something else so we can take the spotlight off of our evangelical idols. So I digress. you sound very American calling us clowns just for the record. Like you don't you you literally know none of us. <laughs> like you know nothing about any of us and yet you're here and you feel very confident to levy names against us and assume things about us that that's not even true. So yeah, yeah. 
Are and, there any admins in the building? If there's an admin in the building, time him out. And yeah, we got to we gotta get Daniel. It's all good. It's all good. Um, I mean, and, and look, for those who's part of this audience who's been rocking with us for years now, a couple years now, um, you know, like I don't have to reiterate my position on every single live I do. I do this every week. <laughs> like, and we don't do this happen. So I'm not going to sit and try to re-explain my whole understanding. But anyway, um, the last one I wanted to share is from Dr. King, where he says, um, I have been uh, from the book, Why We Can't Wait. And he was saying this, well, at a time prior to now, and we're still waiting. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I have a, been so greatly disappointed with the white church and his leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions, and I'm not unmindful of the fact. And I would say today there's a lot more exceptions. So I, I want to be clear. There's a lot of progress that has happened. A lot of this is happening, and we're grateful for it, and we're not denying any of that. So let me clarify that, too. Uh, <laughs> all right, y'all. What in the world is going on? Okay, I'm gonna, let me focus. Um, I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you has taken some significant stands on this issue. I commend you, Reverend Stallings, for your Christian stand on this past Sunday in welcoming Negroes to your worship service on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders of this state for integrating Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church, like we were saying earlier. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. So from, from, from the, you know, the beginnings of slavery to the, to the ending-ish of civil rights, we see the same words being spoken for hundreds of years and, and sometimes decades and hundreds of years a gap. And so it's like, how can Martin Luther King be saying this when a hundred years ago, Douglas was saying something like this and, and, and why didn't nothing happen? And, or like, why didn't everything happen in those hundred years? And so to, to, to the point that he wrote a book, why we can't wait. <laughs> like, it, like, it's not like there wasn't work being done prior to that. Um, sorry, hold on. Let me just, uh, yeah. So let me turn it over to y'all. You jump in first, Chris, go ahead. I'm a little, dis I'm a little distracted by the comments with, you know, people all of a sudden showing up and, and making comments that about something that, you know, just being a, the living embodiment of the critique that, People who don't understand and don't listen, but are judging complete strangers. And, and that just makes no sense to me. You know, I don't understand how people think that God would be, uh, God would approve of that type of a behavior. But um, I mean, Americans would, because that's, that's typical American behavior. It's certainly not godly behavior to speak on things that you're not informed on. So anyway, um, yeah, so let me, let me get a second to collect my thoughts. Well, can we make uh, like uh, somebody an admin so they can. Yeah, yeah, I got admins working on it. We're good. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, what do you um, what do you say, Pastor Isaiah, just with regards to this quote or with regards to Dr. King and his and his feelings uh, then and, and how they even carry forward now? What do you you know, because he wasn't specifically talking about Edwards and Whitfield in this statement, but I'm sure he's was well aware of, of, of the um, his predecessors, theological predecessors in this country. And so. You know, getting to back to your point that you said, and it's very clear in this passage, at least, that he is coming from, he's starting from the position of Christian pastor. And, and that is where his um, ideological statements are coming from. And I, like, I love how you said it's not some little uh, caveat that's tacked on to his identity. This is, this is at the core of his identity, as it should be at the core of ours. Who I am first is not a black man. Who I am first is is a, is a child of God, um, wrapped in black skin. But that that same foundation of if if Whitfield considered himself a child of God, and King does, and I do, and 
we should operate from that. And so all we're doing for, for those who are really trying to take this conversation seriously, we're simply trying to clarify history. We're not trying to rewrite it. We're trying to um, give credence to those who came before us, whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter because we can all learn from Frederick Douglass or King or whoever. And so we're just trying to help to clarify some things, help to bring some historical context that maybe is foreign, is clearly foreign to some people, <laughs> but that's our goal here. So for those who would want to engage in an active and a truly um, enlightening discussion, hey, stick with us. We're, we're, we're going to get there. But with regards to Dr. King and this quote right here, what, what do you all want to say? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Dr. King saw it firsthand, right? Um, he's on the on the front lines. You know, he's organizing. He's marching. He is, uh, you know, with people that are sitting at lunch counters and uh, enduring the worst kind of abuse. He's walking over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. At the same time, you've got Billy Graham, who's packing out stadiums all over the country. Yet Billy Graham is conspicuously missing from the freedom struggle. Um, and Billy Graham is not actively as he's having these crusades and preaching the gospel, he's not also telling people in these meetings where there are thousands of people to actively oppose the ungodly and demonic system of Jim Crow, right? He's, he's doing certain things that make him, you know, cutting edge. He may hold an integrated service here and there, but, but, but he's not including in his rhetoric the need for all people, particularly Christians, to join with those on the front lines in opposing this demonic system of Jim Crow. And so Martin Luther King saw firsthand what, you know, black and brown people have seen historically, right? And, and we're also seeing it in some degree now, right? This idea that, 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 you know, I set the tone, right? And if you, if you don't jump on my program, right? And if you don't um, automatically come along with where I'm going, then somehow you're ungodly, somehow you're, uh, you know, you're demonic, somehow you're foolish, right? This, this is the, this is the arrogance of evangelicalism. It's as old as Whitfield and 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 uh, and Edwards, right? Um, and it's something that the black church saw this 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 glaring hypocrisy, where you know black people sat back while the white church says said you know if you don't value what we value and if you don't think the way we think, then somehow you're unsaved or you're hellbound or you're devilish. Um, and you know, black and brown people, and particularly the African American church, said no. This is, like this is not the case. And so, uh, you know, you know, kudos to Dr. King for you know having this insight. Uh, he also expresses it in his letter from a Birmingham jail. And this is this is what we're saying all along, right? I, I watched this clip today of a of a of a so called prophet uh, named Hank Kuhneman, right? And I don't know if I can name names, but 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 I'm going to name his. Um, and in this clip, he was addressing the fire that he had come under for prophesying that Trump would win the election. And rather than being contrite, rather than repenting and admitting he was wrong, he doubled down and then he proceeded to regurgitate all of the talking points that came directly out of the Trump campaign about a stolen election, right? And then proceeded to wrap all of that in some type of religious evangelical language, right? And it was like this, this, this gumbo, this strange mix of evangelicalism, nationalism, Trumpism, uh, you know, um, decisionism, right? All rolled up into this weird gumbo. And those of us who, who, who kind of see this charade as what it is, sit back and we say, God is not there, right? That, that Whatever that is, that is spiritually 
bankrupt. The, the spirit is not motivating and animating that. That is not true and undefiled, you know, religion that the apostle James talks about in, in his epistle. And so I think the king is just, um, is just, is just expressing that reality. And, and, and to a large degree, this mindset still exists today. Amen, Isaiah. And, um, you know, I really think that, um, I mean, I think there's some, uh, you know, I'm always trying to kind of deconstruct, uh, you know, what I'm seeing and try to figure out like, well, why are, why are we seeing this? Why are things like that? I think a part of the problem is this very, um, you know, this, this, this very mistaken notion of what God cares about. And I, can, I guess that kind of goes back to this, you know, false dichotomy of orthodoxy and orthopraxy that I was kind of referring to earlier today. And, um, you know, if, if you're leaning or if you think that what God cares about is orthodoxy, and I put finger quotes on that because it's like, that's, it's not to imply that we don't care about orthodoxy. We care deeply about orthodoxy. It, it's, it's, it's a mistaken notion to think that we don't care about it when, if we have a disagreement with you, because you might see things one way and we might see things differently. And, and there's, there's still the question of, are either of us right or one of us wrong? Um, or, or are we, either of us getting the full picture of these things? Unfortunately, you know, you know, what they, the way that they think had become standardized. And once it became standardized, you know, for them, it's like, hey, these people aren't living up to what we think is essential, what we think matters. So, um, yeah, it's it's deeply disappointing, and not, and it's very much still the case today, where a lot of people sit on the sidelines and um and and, and sit out, standing up against things, even things that they believe in. You know, I, I know churches. Um, you know, last summer when it was uh when all of the protests was going on and everyone was 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 um uh really wrestling with in the public eye you know particularly on social media and in the in the news media you know with these issues the ethics of these issues there were many churches that were like preach the gospel many churches as if this isn't the gospel like we're not talking <laughs> about gospel issues they're like just preach the gospel and i'm like well what do you think the gospel is cuz you know, I, I don't know you know this this kind of sounds like gospel issues to me you know last time i checked you know john the baptist in luke chapter 3 is like hey if if you're an officer don't bear false witness. Be content with your wages. You know, he was telling him about societal justice things in the way for it gospel of Luke. So to me, these are the very types of issues that theology informs that that should that should um, permeate the life of the, the people who represent Christ down here on earth. These are the very types of things that we should we should be actually talking about. And, it, and it's it's disappointing, as Dr. Martin Luther King is kind of lamenting in his statement there, that so many people either don't get it or are not committed enough to it. There, and I think that not commitment is afraid of their peers. That's what that is predominantly. It's not that um, it's not that they wouldn't stand up. It's they're they're afraid of what they're going to lose. How many of their checkbooks are going to walk out the door when they stand up and speak up for Christ? And, and, and I would ask the question: Is that really standing up for Christ? Are, are you really doing something that's righteous and good or that God would approve of if you're more worried about the, the people who are going to walk out of the door than what is actually right and true and God honoring? Yeah, so I, I absolutely. One hundred percent agree with uh, Dr. King. Um, I, I, I wonder, again, how we can how how can we get to a point to where churches White churches in particular, again, and when I say white church, I'm just being descriptive in right. the sense of where the conflict lies or where the problem, where the solution to the problem lies. You know, how do we get to a point to where churches begin to regularly, consistently stand up for the things that the Bible, that the Bible promotes and that the Bible espouses as the things that God cares about? And we, and we should be disappointed with a church that dichotomizes orthodoxy and orthopraxy, right? We should also be disappointed with the church that says, oh, wait, we don't dichotomize orthodoxy and orthopraxy because, look, we're standing up for abortion and we're standing against gay rights as if orthopraxy only entails opposing abortion and, and gay marriage, right? Right. 
So we should be disappointed in a church that that that's that is is blind, uh, that is unable to see past their culture, unable to uh, you know think deep enough uh, to 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 really consider some of the, the 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 social implications that we've been discussing tonight. We should be disappointed with a church that is uh, just so you know rooted in. Um, you know, historical, well, I'm, I'm not even gonna go there. We should be disappointed with that type of church. Yeah. And, and, and I think that uh, Martin Luther King's sentiments here um, are spot on. And we should also recognize those who do it just as he did. He recognized a couple pe- a couple people in churches who were actually cared enough to stick their necks out and to participate in, in, in the, the act, the leading of society to righteousness, which is leading them to God. And, and I do the same thing again, again, like by the grace of God, I go to a, a wonderful church that is predominantly white, it's like 90% white, but it's, it's a church that cares about these types of problems and that's participating and that is putting their skin in the game of making a difference. You know, I, I wish I had time to tell you some of the stories of, of what people at my church are doing. They're giving away cars they're fixing people's poor people's cars for free. They're funding this food kit, you know. Uh, uh, they're funding um, food kitchens at, at churches in impoverished neighborhoods. You know, for me, it's 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 encouraging to participate in a community in spite of the cultural differences. It's encouraging to participate in a community of God believers that truly gets the Bible and 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 believe it enough to do it where it counts. Amen to that. Um, what the heck are they talking? Okay, so we're gonna close. <laughs> I don't know what the where did y'all come from, but you know what? I take it These as a compliment. Definitely trolls. I take it as a compliment because you know you got to you got to build your channel a little bit to get to get these kind of trolls. Right. <laughs> so I take it as a compliment. You know, at least they can't come in and with 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 other stuff. Or I don't know if uh, you were yeah. on that that debate that Matthew had with uh that, with uh. With that one pastor where they came into the Zoom meeting and doing oh, crazy well, yeah, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Zoom is Zoom. Is, yeah, anyway. And also, and, and also, I don't mean to cut you off, but let me just say what we're talking about is caring for human beings from the womb to the tomb, right? It's not enough just to, just to you know, say, what about the unborn, right? Well, what about after they're born, right? What about exactly what we've been talking about all night you know the, the 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 human flourishing that's afforded to them as citizens within the kingdom so while we care about the unborn we also care about yeah. human beings once they come out <laughs> right and they're actually here on this earth so you know i think mo- most people uh are pro pro birth and not necessarily pro life and i think we're engaging in a truly pro-life conversation because we're worried about life from the womb to the tomb. Yeah, it, it, which is, yeah, so anyway. Hey Amen. So we're not going to keep addressing them, but let, let me just say a couple of things as I close. Um, and I appreciate both you brothers and, you know, this is this is the life we live, so it's not, it's not, not a big deal. But um, the hope and the plan, if you, if anybody goes back to the beginning and watches, it was laid out. I tried to lay it out very clearly. Our hope is, you know, I think BK said this, that the opposite of white supremacy is not black supremacy. So we're not, that's never where I'm going. That's never where we're going. Goal is to A, get history correct so that we don't get the future wrong. And number and number two or three, I don't even know what number I'm on. Like, this is the thing. And I, and I hope it's trolls because then that means it's not real people thinking this way. Yeah. But there are real people who think this way, so I'm going to address y'all anyway. Here, here's, especially in the church, I'm not worried about the world, because we have a different standard that we're supposed to be um, held to. I don't see how any believer, whatever color, I don't care what color, race, ethnicity, when you, and I was trying to explain this when everything was happening in 2020. George Floyd's not the issue. Rihanna Taylor's not the issue. Um, Arbery, the, those are one-off incidents. And I'm saying this mostly to my white brothers and sisters. Let me say it like this. The people that were upset, the black people were upset, or, or still are, the riots that happened, I don't condone rioting, so let me also get that out of the way. But I did march peacefully. Um, but the people who are who are out and uh, after these things happen, it, it, what you're not seeing 
is the years of racism that this is like a tipping point for. So it wasn't like we were just sitting at home on our couch and then all of a sudden George Floyd happened. And everybody got up like, what the heck? Let's go fight. <laughs> That's not what happened. Every instance of racism I've ever experienced in my life never made the news. The reason never made the news, because I lived. That's it. 90 plus percent of the racism that ever occurs with um, to black people or anybody, it doesn't make the news. You're never going to see it unless you're in the community that experiences it or unless you're the person that experiences it. But what King and Du Bois and Douglas and Gustavo and all these others are saying is like, look, there is a collective experience that you may not be privy to. But if you consider yourself to be a Christian, when I make you privy to this, you should be, you should be appalled, as you all said. And for those Christians, at least, who are not appalled, who are not pushing back, who are not saying some of the things we're saying, you should question some of your own convictions. I'm going to leave it there. So, Pastor Isaiah, apologies <laughs> in Detroit. Um, I think we're done stirring the hornet's nest for tonight. Um, I appreciate you. Um, um, I even appreciate the trolls. <laughs> even y'all created an image of God. <laughs> I don't appreciate the trolls. I'm ready. Look, look, yeah, look Compton got, got in me. Compton got in me. <laughs> That's right. I'm not. I stopped reading, so I don't even know what they said. But anyway. I love y'all. I appreciate you all, everyone. Um, until next time, peace.